Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran at a genuine loss for why Radio Shack closed permanently, or else a scrappy upstart at a genuine loss for why you can't just track your entire new album over a Bluetooth signal, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey guys, it's the last Friday of September 2018. I'm glad that you're here. Big show today, guys. Big, big show. This has been in the works for a long time, and I'm so glad that it's upon us. Now, as you're listening to this, I'm recording this episode a week before publication, because when it airs, I will be hunkered down in a studio in Nashville, Tennessee, to track my next album. This album has been a long time in the making. I've been working on the writing of it for the last 18 months, and now I get to do the really fun part, which is to just go into a studio with a bunch of fancy German microphones and a big fat API console and just get the songs across. So I'm very excited for that. If you're listening to this on the day of publication, I'll still be in the studio, so send some good vibes my way. Send some positive well wishes, and I will gratefully receive them. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming months, here's where I'll be. The 6th of October, I'll be in Augusta, Georgia at the West Abu Festival. The 17th of October, I'll be in New York City for the second of three working songwriter residencies at City Winery with a very special guest that night. October 25th in Fairfield, Connecticut at Stage 1, the 26th in Boston, the 27th in Northampton, Massachusetts. Then uh, November 16th, I'll be in Cincinnati, Ohio, the 17th in Worthington, Ohio, the 18th in Buffalo, New York, the 19th in Rochester, and then the 20th for the third and final, for now, Working Songwriter Residency at City Winery in New York with a very special guest. Then, November 30th, I'll be in Denver at the Bluebird with the Little Smokies. And then December 5th at Chicago's City Winery. And then December 6th through 8th, I'll be in Philadelphia for what is basically a mini festival that Strand of Oaks is putting on this year. He puts it on, he's called it kind of the winter, he calls it the winter classic. And uh, um, every December he has... Songwriters that he loves come up to the Boot and Saddle in Philadelphia for uh, a couple nights of shows. They always sell out well in advance. Uh, Tim is so beloved there in Philadelphia especially. So if you're thinking about coming out to those shows, I would get on your tickets early. I will be there all three nights in Philly. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, if you're a listener to this show, but you've never heard any of my songs before, we should rectify that. Uh, and a good place to do that is over at Spotify. Just search the words intro to Joe Pug, and a playlist will come up with about 10 songs distilled from all the different albums and EPs I've put out over the years that'll give you a pretty good idea of what I'm all about musically. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help out. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. What is that? Uh, what is Patreon? It's a platform that allows you to directly support a creative endeavor that you find meaningful. And you just head to their site, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, basically. A subscription that you don't have to pay, but that you choose to pay because you dig the show and you won't miss the price of a cup of coffee or whatever every month. Um, and over there, you can grab a sweet Working Songwriter t-shirt designed by Pearl Rachinsky at Pearl Jr. 
all of her design stuff on Instagram. Or you can check out all the other content I've posted over there for supporters at Patreon. There's the first episode of the new podcast concept that I did with Tim Showalter called The Oaks Chamber. There's the first episode of the Working Songwriter Alumni Show, where I catch up with past guests. That features B.J. Barham of American Aquarium. And this month, hopefully, I'll be posting the audio from our first Working Songwriter residency event in New York that I just did with the wonderful Birds of Chicago. Did I also tape a, uh, a proper Working Songwriter episode with them? Maybe I did. We'll find out soon. Um, head on over there to Patreon to support if you want to do it in that way. If you're not in a place where you can contribute in that way, it's, it's totally understandable. I've been there more times than I haven't. And uh, I would just ask that maybe you could leave us a review in iTunes, which is free. And also, if you could, to just tell a friend about the show. That's totally free. Okay, that's all the harassment for this month. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. We, we've had a lot of distinguished guests on the show so far, and we've been very lucky and grateful for that. But I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to say that this is our first guest who pioneered an entire musical genre themselves. And, you know, myself growing up around D.C., bands like Minor Threat and Fugazi and all the bands on Discord really loomed large in my musical imagination, were really kind of founding rocks of my musical mythology as a kid. And, you know, doing this episode was so fun. Even the research for it has been fun. For example, you'll hear in just a moment when I reference um, Ian's musical trajectory, he used to go see these big arena rock concerts at the Cap Center in Landover, Maryland, and no joke, that's where I graduated high school. I, I found out that I walked across the stage to grab a diploma in the same room that Ian MacKay and Henry Rollins saw Jimmy Page play Cashmere. So, obviously, for, for personal reasons, this has been probably the most fulfilling episode that I've gotten to tape so far. And I also just got to say that all of my interactions with him and in setting up this whole interview were exactly as I could have wished for them to be. I mean, he had no publicist or agent or third party to go through. He set it up directly himself. And when I arrived at the Discord house in Arlington, he was there by himself with the lights off because the place doesn't have air conditioning and he wanted to keep it cool. And he was rolling cables, just rolling up XLR and RCA cables by himself in the dark. Perfect. Absolutely perfect for how I wanted my first Ian MacKay experience to go <laughs> in my life, man. So yeah, it was a peak uh, professional experience for me, man, to meet the man, to get a glimpse into his world. And if you enjoy this episode one iota as much as I enjoyed putting it together, I think you're really going to dig it. So enjoy. Our guest today is a celebrated songwriter and a founder of one of the longest running and most influential independent record labels in American history. Ian MacKay was raised in the Glover Park neighborhood of Washington, D.C., in a family that was active in the socially progressive St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. In his formative years, he would pal around with neighborhood friend Henry Rollins to mainstream rock concerts like Led Zeppelin, Ted Nugent, and Queen at the Cap Center in Landover, Maryland. All that changed when he attended a concert by the Cramps at Georgetown University. He was introduced to punk music, and neither he nor punk would be the same again for it. He formed Minor Threat in 1980, and after releasing a string of influential EPs and a studio album, the band dissolved due to creative differences. In 1987, he was a founding member of Fugazi, who, over the next few decades, would establish themselves as an essential American band. The band was known for their ferocious sound, 
pointed lyrics, and their uncompromising business ethos. That ethos made them something of a spirit animal to bands signed to major labels in the 1990s, with Kurt Cobain name-checking them in Rolling Stone and Eddie Vedder going on MTV's Headbangers Ball with their name written on his arms. Besides being the principal songwriter and singer for Minor Threat and Fugazi, Mackay founded Discord Records in 1980. The company has released albums not only by those bands, but also The Faith, Void, Rites of Spring, Jawbox, Scream, and a host of others. The homegrown company has sold millions of records. Today, Mackay spends most of his time managing the label and playing with The Evens, the band he formed with his wife, Amy Farina. He had me meet him at the Discord House in Arlington, Virginia, and as military helicopters buzzed above toward the cemetery, he and I sat down to talk about his storied life in music. Well, hey, I want to start a little bit in left field for this interview because... Shouldn't you, shouldn't we... Uh Slate it? Yeah, we can. Well, so usually I just do that in post-production, but we, we you absolutely... You should slate it beforehand, because someone signs these recordings. You start out by saying... Yeah. This is Ian McKay. Hey, this is Joe Pug. No, the... no, 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 no. Oh, it's, yeah. like it's like a engineer slate. Okay. Ian McKay, August 28th? 28th? Yeah, yeah. 28th, today. Mm-hmm. August 28th, 2018, Ian McKay, Discord House, Arlington, Virginia. I like that. Now you know. That's why when you find the recording, that just tells you ahead of time what's on it. We'll slate it, yeah. Okay. Slate your recordings. Then you can always do the the podcasty crap later. (laughs) But you want to start with a slate. Well, so this is the engineer mind that I want to talk about, actually, because when I said I wanted to start in left field, getting ready for this interview, it kind of blew me away. This This is something I didn't know about you. You have so many different credits for engineering and mixing over the years. How did you end up on the technical side of records, and was it out of interest or was it out of necessity? I didn't do a lot of engineering. Don Zentera did most of the engineering. I produced and mixed a lot of the the recordings. Um, It's August 2018, which means 38 years ago was the first time I went to Inner Studios here in Arlington. Um, I was playing bass in the Teen Idols, which was sort of my first wasn't the very first band I was in. The first band I was in was called the Slinkies, but we only played one show. And then our singer went to college. We got another singer, and that was became the Teen Idols, I D L E S Idols. Um, I played bass in that band. And <clears throat> in the summer of 1980, Skip Groff, um, who owned a record store in Rockville called Yesterday and Today, um, he had heard me t- us talking about. Um, our frustration with the recording process. We had recorded a different studio, and that particular engineer, um, the guy who ran that studio, he restru- tried to reshape. Like he took, he tried to reshape our sound. He thought oh, there's too much distortion. You're too crazy, and he he just had a different idea about what was. Sp- like he was trying to make things sound good to him, which is not like what we were making was not good for him. He didn't like the band, right? So. Uh, so we were very frustrated with that, and Skip said, well, I know a place in Arlington we can go to, and he took us to Inner Ear Studios, and the guy who ran that was Don Sentara. Now, this is a four-track studio with a homemade board. He built the board himself. He's sort of an electronics guy. Oh, wow. And uh, he um, it was in a house here in South Arlington and recorded in a rec room, basically, uh, but the thing about Don was that he was interested in helping us get what we wanted. Um, he was not flustered by our sound or our distortion or even like our mistakes. He didn't care. He just wanted us to be happy. Um, and that, out of that, developed you know a friendship. Like you know, we did the Teen Idols, and then Henry recorded SOA there, and Meyer Threat went there, and then it just every band we just went there because mm-hmm. Don was. He was, and he is still a great guy. I actually just was on the phone with his wife about an hour ago, and I talked to Don yesterday. So, um, you know, we still work together. Don, I've done, I've been in the studio probably hundreds of times over the last 30 some years, almost 40 years. Um, and I've almost always worked with Don. Now, he's an engineer. I'm not really an engineer. Mm-hmm. I'm actually 
Um, I think I'm a terrible engineer because I just don't, I can't ever, I know what I want, but I don't really, I get caught up in the spaghetti of it all, like the wires. And I just get, it gets too confusing. Um, I can work, once I know how things work, I can work very quickly because I know what I want, but um, I never get the nuts and bolts. However, um, I'm an archivist uh, and I have gone through many, 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 even thousands of recordings. And I have listened to many, many, many interview tapes. And a lot of those tapes are not ID'd. Yeah. They don't say who the person is, and it doesn't say where it was recorded. And I think that's interesting. I like I would like to know, like when you come across a tape, I have tapes from people being interviewed. Um, well, first off, like in terms of music. I have interview tapes from the mid 80s and early 80s. Mm-hmm. And I can recognize most of the people's voices. Um, there are a few that I can't. Mm-hmm. And occasionally I can figure out where they are by the sound of the room, like the 930 hallway, or, or there's some contextual, they'll mention something, and I can, like, my detective brain will leap into action. They'll mention, like, oh, so and so just played, but so and so is getting ready to go on. Yeah, and then I'll think, wait a minute, that show where was that? And then I'll do research, and then, you know, um, it would have been solved if the person had just said, "Here's who's talking." But it sounds like you yeah. like the research, though. So I love. I must say, the people like I have done a lot of archivist work, and what I really love is the detective work. Like I like figuring stuff out, but not. I would prefer if it was just there. I mean, obviously, right. but it, given like I just get caught up in that. I like it. That's the kind of stuff that like I really enjoy. Digging. Now, all this stuff, is, I have to say that I do a lot of different things. Like when you came in here today, I was untangling cords and I was on the phone with somebody in the hospital trying to help them sort out some stuff. Um, my life is a constant parade of um, different tasks and things. I like it like that. Like I, every day I wake up with too much to do that I want to do. Um, but it's all problem solving. Yeah. So what and is a that's typical day? Song, and so I'm sorry to say, and that like it's problem solving, and that's the way I approach music too. So what does a typical day for you look like? Like what time do you wake up? I get up, you, today. I get up at five or five thirty. Wow, um, that's not unusual. It's five thirty six, um, and then I get you know breakfast started, and um, usually around six forty five, I wake up my son. I have a ten year old, mm-hmm. and uh, we have breakfast. You know, take care of the stuff around the house, and then I take him to school. Um, usually, um, I'll pick up Joe Lally, who's a bass player in Fugazi, but also has been playing with me and uh, Amy and I, the three of us play together, and uh, pick him up in around 9.15, and then we play music for a few hours. So I played music this morning till almost noon. Then I come out here to Discord, and then I just, whatever it takes. Like, so today, for instance, I had a meeting across the street at the, that's where the other office is, the distribution office is across the street. So there's a couple of shit over there we had to have. I talked to this guy in the hospital. I talked to a lost and found at Metro because a friend of mine left his bike on the bus, which is insane, but trying to help him sort that out. Um, I just returned a few calls, and I have a long list of things to do yet. You know, I have, so every day is different, but it's always the same. Mm-hmm. You're a doer. You, you like to feel a, a forward momentum in a day. Is it hard for you to take a vacation then? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not like a. I'm not a compulsive person. Like I'm. I actually believe in idleness. I don't mind. Like I'll sit and look out a window. And frankly, if I didn't believe in idleness, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Most people <laughs> think of like interviews as like a weird way to spend time. I don't. Yeah. Like I enjoy, but it's but it's not getting much done for me. Right. Right. My my list is the same fucking length at the end of this interview, except for one thing, which was do interview with Joe Pug. Well, hey man, that uh, that moves right. it forward one one but check I'm, mark. Yeah, but you know that's the, but it's that's here nor there. For me, the, all the work I do has always everything I've ever done has been has been able is really I think has been in service um, to having conversations with people, and that's sort of the point. Like that's why I do music. It's why I do work. Is to, so I knocked you out. Sorry, um, I hit the microphone there. Um, the work that I do, the music and everything else, has always really been focused on. Um, I think 
a conversation. Being connected with other human beings. It's really interesting you'd say that because we talked on the phone, let's say, six months ago for about 10 minutes. And one of the things that you said to me was, I don't know exactly who I'm writing songs for right now. Right. And that makes sense to me now that you think of it as a conversation. So if you're having a conversation, you should know who you're talking to or right. have an idea. I mean, I think in, when I, <clears throat> for me, all music is always, like I've always tried to write songs that people will sing. Because that, I think, the um, the most elevated state that I've been in, or one of the most elevated states I've ever been in, uh, frequently is being in a room with people singing. That you know, when the, when this when people are <clears throat> when shame is not in the picture and people have are all communally lost to the moment, like that. That is that is like the peak of life for me, you know. It's and it's, it's an intimate experience, you know. And it's, I can't say it's unlike having in an intimate relationship with somebody, you know. That same moment of like everything is, it's all out there, you know. Like we are, there's no shame. And uh, I, it's all good. Really, this is this will go right into your thing, the helicopter. I know, but it's just giving some. Uh, yeah. It gives some ambiance. I should tell people that Discord House is is uh, maybe a half a mile or a mile from the Pentagon, so we get we're close. We get hey. a lot of helicopters, and the other thing is uh, we get a lot of uh, flyovers because we're very close to Arlington National Cemetery. So whenever yeah. you have a high-ranking uh, Air Force person, they do this missing man formation. So these F-16 or whatever kind of jets. We'll mm -hmm. go three of them with like the fourth one missing. Yeah. We'll go streaking over the house. You hear it pretty pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah, you guys are close. I, I don't want to miss though uh, the end of this point that you were making there because I think it was great. Oh. You, this elevated state that you get in. Yeah, I, I do think it touches some part of uh, our reptile brain. I think we've been doing this for a very long time as human beings, being together uh, and communicating in that way. Well, you. I mean, I don't know if you ever heard me say this, but I've said this many, many times. That, Music is a form of communication that predates language. Sure. And so I think it is sacred. And not Christian sacred. <laughs> it's right. like sacred, sacred. Like before, Christianity is like Johnny come lately, in my mind. You know, like this goes back well before, you know, any organized religion. I think people use rhythms and intonations to communicate with each other. And I think music today, still, when we sing... You know, we shape sounds into words um, frequently, not always. Um, but we're really communicating as something different than what those words are. So when I write, for instance, <clears throat> like there was a period of time where I was, I was really feeling stuck um, in my songwriting. I had like a like writer's block. And uh, I would talk to various peers, musician friends of mine. And there is a oft- um, repeated thing, which I'm sure you've heard, which is get out of the way. Like you're in the way. Like we're just uh, a lightning rod for, you know, whatever. God's, <laughs> God's yeah. creative power, whatever. That yeah, kind just of, a vessel, right. basically. I, I actually reject that. Um, I think it's, there's actually kind of a weird conceit to that. This idea like, oh yeah, I'm God's special translator for, you know, like I, that seems ridiculous to me. You know, to me. Um, I actually think that music comes out of us um, as any, and everybody has a form of some kind of creative, something comes up. Um, and, but still I felt like it's weird. Like I was really struggling. And then I realized that the music part of it, I don't have ever have any trouble writing. I, you give me a guitar, I'll come up with a riff. Now yeah. maybe similar to another riff I've written. It doesn't matter. Like it is like I'll just write. I write and write and write and write. There's riffs and riffs and riffs. And then I might follow, like I might come across a riff and then it will take me somewhere. Because it's linear for me. Like I'll play something and then I'll go like, oh, this needs to go here. And then I'll go there and like, oh, well, I know what this has to do now. And then, you know, it's like it's it's like it fo I just follow that path. Um and I don't know if it's as a result of um listening to music for so many years that I have some, there's some weird schematic or blueprint in my mind about yeah. what sound should follow. Um, I never studied music. I can't read music. Uh, 
I once was playing something for somebody who was very learned, who understood music theory, and he said, oh, you're doing a whatever the word was. And then he did a, what he actually understood what I was doing. I, but it was as if, but I, it was certainly not intentional. Mm-hmm. It was just what sounded right to me. Um, so writing music is not a problem. And I know what those songs are about, right? But I mm-hmm. can't put it into words, literally. Do you understand? Like those are lyrics, because the words are lyrics. So I know what my pieces of music, I understand what they're about, but mm-hmm. I can't put them into words. Um, that's why I play them. That's why yeah. I play the guitar. That's why I write the songs that way. So then <clears throat> I play them for myself, or if I'm playing with other people, we'll start developing it, and, we'll, and then it becomes our song, right? It starts out as my song, then becomes our song, which, and that means that other people will, <clears throat> they're in the relationship, like in the, because the, I think of banter relationships for me, uh, they will start shaping along with me because they also hear things and, mm-hmm. and we're working together. That's a relationship. Um, oops, sorry, helicopter coming. So um, at some point we have an instrumental song. Now that it could be, it could stay that way and I would be satisfied. But if we decide that we want to present this song in public, then I have to write words, right? Because the words, <clears throat> without the words, um, people won't understand the song in the same way. Like in my, this is how I look at it. Like they'll, like I want to communicate to them like what the song is about. So I want to put it into words now. So then I have to find words that will um, meet the challenge that will like that resonate with me. Words that actually will in some degree, will um, be representative of the significance of this piece of music for me. Um, and that's a challenge. You know, that's why I, when I write lyrics, I, I got to believe them. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm not, like, I, I, I understand there's plenty of people who can write and just, like, they just throw words in and it's like, and they should, maybe it's just a sound, like a sonic thing and they just know this sounds good or maybe it's just all imagery and they just kind of toss that in there and I respect it. Yeah. Like, I, I don't have any issue with that. But for me, like, I have to believe it. Like, I just can't, I don't, I can't sing something that doesn't mean something to me. And presumably means something to who you believe that you're talking to, that, that other party. I mean, I don't know about that because I am only interested really in the transmission. Right. And transmission and reception are two different things. Um, so any piece of art or any any kind of offering, whether it's like, for instance, if you were a chef, maybe you are a chef, I don't know, but if you were to cook something and something that you write to your taste, you could bring it to a room of people and the six people and, you know, five of them might think it's delicious and the sixth one think it's, it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, Transmission and reception are different things, and people are not wrong. Like when someone says to me, "Oh, this song's about that," I'm like, "Okay, yeah, <laughs> I suppose." You know, I don't know. I, I just don't. You know, like I, for me, I know what the song, what I was writing about. But once you release it, yeah, I mean, literally, I don't mean release it through a record. I mean release it like a butterfly or something. Like once you let the song go, um, what it's about is up to the listener. There's a truism that you'll hear bandied about often, which is jazz music is the only true art form America has ever contributed to the world. Now, there's people who have a bone to pick with that. Some would argue that the American inventions of film, of comic books, and even of video games are equally iconic contributions. But that nitpicking is kind of missing the spirit of the question. Of course jazz, which was the catch-all term for all African-American music at the turn of the 20th century, of course jazz probably best represents our national contribution because 
It's the trunk of a tree that gave us branches into blues and bebop, rock and roll, rap, a host of others. But there are a number of uniquely American musical dialects, and just because they don't rise to the station of jazz doesn't mean that they're insignificant. American hardcore is chief among those homegrown musical voices. Punk music in general was an artifact of a 1960s counterculture that had atrophied. Kids coming of age in the late 70s were old enough to remember the ideals of the 1960s social movements, such as racial equality, pacifism, environmentalism. But they were also young enough to notice how that 60s idealism had entered into a decadent phase in the 1970s that was defined largely by heavy drug use and conquest-driven sex. They leveled a partly justified critique at the flower power generation that they were just simply draping virtuous platitudes around a crass desire to party, blow off some steam, and get laid. So, the punks rebelled against the rebels. How it developed from there is described by Michael Azarad in his seminal book, Our Band Could Be Your Life. He writes, Hardcore was the latest volley in a transatlantic tennis game with punk rock as the ball. The British had received the first wave of American punk bands. Richard Hell, Television, Talking Heads, Blondie, The Ramones. And they fired back with the Sex Pistols, The Damned, Buzzcocks, and countless others. So hardcore music was yet another rebellion, this time against the punks themselves. As Khalifa Senna put it in The New Yorker, the idea was to outpunk the punks, thereby recapturing the wild promise of the genre with its tantalizing suggestion that rock music should be something more than mere entertainment, that it should somehow pose a threat to mainstream culture. Scenes developed independently around the world in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, and most notably, Washington, D.C. The sonic fingerprints are unmistakable. Punk music still hewed close to mainstream rock's reliance on melody. Hardcore music instead emphasized throttling rhythms and anguished vocals. And hardcore didn't just distinguish itself musically. The cultural idiosyncrasies that defined hardcore, you could argue, have been in some ways more enduring than the sound. Their ethos celebrated independent record labels and imprints, DIY fanzines, networks of house concerts and vaguely legal venues, and a wholesale rejection of commercialism. There was also an emphasis on band members, not just being the talent on stage, but true members of a community who would be equally at home ripping off a guitar riff or stuffing seven-inch vinyl in sleeves, roading for a friend's band, or answering the record label's telephone. The D.C. hardcore scene added a final cultural wrinkle that's known the world over. The minor threat songs Straight Edge, Out of Step with the World, and In My Eyes had lyrics that laid out a worldview of sober and forthright living, or what many would call rebellion through self-control. And that movement was also called Straight Edge. So you really never know where your music will end up. You release it into the world, and it takes on a life of its own. The songs that Mackay wrote for 10 friends at Wilson High School became an entire culture and an American musical dialect. Absolutely. How did you get out of that period of writer's block that you were in? I'm never out of it. <laughs> but I think. But that, you, you were talking about a particularly acute. Well, there was one, a particular. Yeah, like, it was a time. I think. Well, what was going on really was. I mean, Fugazi. Um, well, I'll I'll say Fugazi. I was writing. A, we wrote a lot, and there's a arc in my writing with that band that was, I think plays a role in this long story. Now I can go back to that. But right at the end of when Fugazi stopped touring and stopped recording, which was 2002, really, beginning of 2003, um, Amy and I had started playing in the Evens. And um, 
Oh, actually, I'll just back it up because it might be easier. Yeah. So in the Teen Idols, I played bass and I wrote some riffs. I started writing lyrics. I've always kind of messed around with lyrics and would write poems. Because as a kid, I used to write poems. And, um, and then I really wanted to sing. I was playing bass in that band. And Nathan, who's a great singer, but he was singing my words, but missing the emphasis like the, the way cadence he didn't yeah he didn't understand what that was like the like what the song like there's certain moments where i wanted to like push on that you know and actually i remember talking to jeff nelson who was a drummer in the teen idols and minor threat um and also co-owner of discord and all that but jeff lived at his family lived up on um 33rd street 33rd and patterson um He'd be 33rd. I think he was on 33rd. Where is he on Patterson? No, he's on Patterson. He's on Patterson. So, but his family, so he, in his room, we were up in his room when, you know, we were in, we were in high school. I think we just got out of high school at that point. Um, I was maybe still in high school. But any event, uh, we, uh, I was telling him, like, I really want to sing. I had this song, like, I, uh, Nathan is great, but I had these other, the way I would sing is different. So we had a practice tape and we were playing the practice tape and I was, singing the songs the way I would have heard them, like the way I wrote them. And I was really uh, being demonstrative. I was sort of jumping around. And his father came running up, banging the door, and he goes, what are you doing? There's plaster falling downstairs. Like I was jumping around so much. And I, I really, I think that I grew up, I was, I loved Janis Joplin. I loved Joe Cocker. I just loved that kind of what appeared to me to be uh complete commitment like shameless like shameless like mm-hmm. just really leaning into it and you know, I first saw Joe Cocker I thought that he was a, like a something wrong with the guy like if you, you know the Woodstock footage is so surreal because he's just like quivering and shaking yeah. and spazzing and and um, but I grew to really love it and Janis Joplin obviously like if you watch footage of her she also is so she just leans into her performance and that really spoke to me and that's how I wanted to sing. So I was writing songs as the Teen Isles were winding up in, in the fall of 1980. I started writing songs for what would become Minor Threat. Um, okay, we knew the band was going to break. The guitar player, Jordy, had quit. And so I knew the band was coming to an end. So I just started writing songs and writing writing the music. And I wrote the music and the lyrics. And then in Minor Threat, because I was just a singer, and I had written a lot of the music in the beginning. And then as Lyle and Brian started to write and Jeff, they start, you know, the band started developing. I still wrote lyrics, but, you know, the songs I was writing, it was very easy to write back then. I was, you know, this because life was, was clear. Um, I was also, you know, I didn't have a family. I didn't. Less those, responsibility. Know, right, right. Yeah. So, and, you know, I used to work in a movie theater and just sit in the box office, just looking out the window in the, on the Wisconsin Avenue on a Friday night and just looking at the masses of people going by. Boy, that was fuel. I could just write a thousand songs about them. So, um, and then I was in, uh, you know, Minor Threat was th- three years. And then Embrace, you know, again, I was really, um, I was prolific. I was writing a lot. I had a lot, there's a lot of politics going on. A lot of, like, there was like, I was in, you know, my early 20s and things were, it was just a lot of, there was a lot of things to write about. Um, but that band was short lived. We only played, I think, 11 shows or something. And it just, completely fell apart. Um, <clears throat> then I thought, oh, I don't want to be in a band. I just want to play music. Because being in a band seemed to be disastrous. So just play music. So that's how I ended up playing with Joe Lally, he who I'd met sitting at this very table when he was roading for Beef Eater in 1986. And then we just started playing. I said, I, do you want to play music with me? Not be in a band, just play music. And he said, sure. So we just started so I started writing songs, and he was still developing his bass playing. And I started writing lyrics, just kind of, not in the very beginning, but at some point, you know, I started writing lyrics because I just had melody ideas and I had some, I had some ideas. Um, by the time Brendan joined, which was six months later, we had another drummer before that. Mm-hmm. Brendan was another band, so I just asked him if he wanted to fill in because we needed someone to play with, and he was practicing here anyway at this house, so... So he started playing, but the songs were almost not entirely, but I'd say ninety percent written by me. Like I wrote the riffs and the lyrics, and you know, boom, and then basically the arrangement. Not everything. I mean, obviously Joe and Brendan. Joe had plenty to say about it, and then Brendan really started to shape things. Um, 
by the very beginning of Fugazi, most of the songs were songs that I basically had written, or not all, but most. Um, and I'd come and say, hey, here's a song. Like, I'd come with music and lyrics. Boom. Um, and then, you know, Guy joined, Guy's in the band, and he starts playing guitar. And I would come in, like, here, yeah, here's a new song. And the band would say, like, you know, well, let's try doing this. I'm like, no, 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 no. That Like, this is the song. Like, here's the part, the verse, the right. chords, of the, the bridge. You know, I had it all worked out. My, I mean, there could be no other way in my mind, right? But they would just break it down. They would just take the song apart. Mm -hmm. And it was painful for me. Like, could I, the song was, in my mind, that's the song. Um, I was getting educated, you know. And they, they, they said straight up, you know, at one point, they said, like, you know, we want to be, like, we're not just playing your songs, like we're a band. And I was like, oh yeah, I get that. I understand it, but it was hard. You know, it was hard. You know, I once told someone that it would be like if I had built a bicycle and then brought it to practice and they said, oh, cool. And then they took a wrench and tore the entire thing apart and put it back together, but left some stuff out. Right. Or put some other weird things in. And I was like, that doesn't ride anymore. That's the way. But it was something for me to learn. And we started to write like, Communal, communally, like we collectively, we would write. Like we, I would never bring in a song anymore. I just bring in a part, and then they would say, "Oh, that's cool. Let's try that part, and we'll put it to this part." And so for years, like I just stopped writing songs. I mean, we would write music, and then at some point, like in the beginning, it was either Guy or I, and then later Joe would say, "Oh, I have an idea for. I'm going to try writing for this one." So then. That person would write the, you know, write the lyrics and sing it. But mo we were really an instrumental band. I mean, I have, you know, dozens if not hundreds of hours of Fugazi practices that are just instrumental stuff. So, do you think that practice of switching from being the guy that would write ninety percent of the song to just coming in with the part, then once Fugazi stopped recording in around you said two thousand two? Well, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. It, it atrophied. Like my ability to write songs atrophied because. I was, we were working collectively. I mean, I think we wrote great songs still. Yes, I'd say so. I mean, I I'd think that, say so. that's it. They, they, those guys, like, making music with them is, you know, wasn't, and we still will get together occasionally and just play music together, and it's amazing. You know, like, we, they're my family. I love, you know, love them, you know, endlessly love them. And uh, um, there is something between the four of us that is, like, an interesting chemical connection. Um but in any event, in, that, in the early 2000s, um, you know, we started having kids. Brendan had his first kid in 97, and then another one in 2000, another one in 2003. Um, and Joe and, and, and Antonia, I mean, obviously Brendan and Michelle had kids, not Brendan. Um, but then Joe and Antonia had a daughter in 2001. And um, as a result of, like, whenever somebody had a kid, the band would have to take off. Like, it was a, our concept was like it was like a no horizon arrangement. Like when the baby comes, like a month or so before, the band just goes on hiatus until they're ready. Because mm -hmm. it's really important. We you know it's like that takes precedence. Um, yeah. Um, but what it meant was that um, for those of us who didn't have kids, that we are sort of in this band that was all consuming but not actually doing anything. Now, I always kept somewhat busy because I have administrative stuff to do, but uh, creatively, it was very frustrating. Amy Farina, who I had known for years, she had moved to Washington in 1990 to go to Corcoran School of Art. She was had been she had played in a number of bands, including the Warmers, which my brother my brother sang guitar sang and played guitar in. And I had recorded them. So I knew Amy and I were old friends. And she and I would often see each other at shows and we'd talk about music. And it's and I we we're, we're great friends. And I'd said to her, Oh, you know, we should play music sometime, which you know, one says to other people. Now, <clears throat> I didn't play music with other people because typically if I played music if I play with somebody, then they're like, Oh, are we in a band now? <laughs> like it just there's no it goes straight right. to that, right? So it just was too I just didn't do it. And, you know, I had a few friends who I could play music with, but um, very lightheartedly, you know. But um, 
But Amy was somebody who I'd just known for so long, and I just trusted her implicitly. And so in, in 2001, when Joe and Antonio were just about to have their daughter, I said to Amy, oh, do you, do you want to play music? And she's like, sure. And so I actually had a like kind of a small bag of songs that I had written sort of outside of Fugazi. There were just things that didn't really, Fugazi just wasn't interested in the riff. And then I kind of just pursued it on my own and, and I remember playing him for her, and she's like, "Oh, I like that." And I was like, "Oh, okay, that's all I need to hear." And, you know, and so I just started kept writing, and and I think at that time I was really prolific lyrically because I was it was like a new liberation to be in a this is because we weren't going to do shows even we we're just in the basement here working and yeah. just writing and writing and writing and writing and I've and it was really a vocal band like it was just about the vocals and um and then of course we fell in love. And that was really helpful in terms of, like, lyrically, you just, like, you're, I just was filled with ideas. Um, I think later, you know, when we had a kid, you know, there's, I think there's a part of the, for me, again, I'm not speaking for all people, um, part of what drove my lyrics, part of that, whatever that creative thing, I think a lot of that gets taken up by being a parent, which is, you know, I actually was talking to a, a woman who's a poet, and she said, I can't write poems because she just became a mother. I said, oh, yeah, you can. It's just right now the poems are in the mani are manifesting as a child. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. Right? Yeah. And that's the same way I feel about music. Like, it just manifests as a child. Another guy told me recently, he said, like, I feel like we, we're just not, like, we're so not productive anymore. Like, when you become a parent, you're not productive. I said, actually, you're enormously productive. It says that you can't recognize your child as a product. Right, it's like it doesn't feel right to say that, but this is the work. Yeah. Like you know, yeah, maybe we're not making you know, I don't know, we're not making stained glass, or we don't, we haven't made a lot of like we haven't created a movie, or you know, whatever it is that people do. Like maybe that productivity has will that will diminish whilst you engage in helping um, a human being. Uh, navigate what it is to grow up into the society. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, that to me is, that's the real work. Like, I'm not saying, I don't think that, I'm not saying that people who don't, don't have children are not doing real work. They are. But I think that ultimately, I don't know anybody who could say that, like the, I mean, it seems to me clear that human beings, like, like the, you know, like that's, if you make a person, they're entirely dependent upon you. Yeah, they didn't ask to be born. Right. You know? So. Yeah. So that's like, it's on you. And I feel like, so, you know, my songs, the lyrics to my songs, at least, I think a lot of those things may well reside in a 10 year old boy right now. And I'm fine with that. So I think that was sort of the, um, that may have been played a role with this sort of sense of um, uh, this writer's block. But, sorry, I don't mean to. No, be, you're good. The other thing I'll tell you about that is that in the very beginning, when I started writing songs, I was writing to like 15 kids at Wilson High School. And then I was writing to maybe 40 kids at Wilson High School. Like, it's interesting. Like, the song, the Minor Thread song, for people who know Minor Thread, I mean, Minor Thread is people still buy those records and they still talk about those lyrics. Um, and it's very strange to think about for me. Sometimes, like, I'll be, like, I can remember, like, a guy in Brazil being, coming to me and being sort of up in arms about one of the lyrics from one of the songs. And I think that if people could understand that at the time that I wrote those songs, I had it never would have, I never even dreamt that anybody outside of, Wilson High School or Washington, D.C. would ever hear these songs. It would never occur to me. I certainly wasn't thinking that it would be something that would go on for 40 years, you know, like that people would talk about for or close to 40 years. Um, and this is a really, a really good example of this. Is like There's a really clear example, which is I wrote a song called Guilty of Being White. Um, mm. And it is a song that I wrote. I went to Wilson High School. It's a public school in Washington, D.C., I went to Gordon Junior High School, which is a public school in Washington, D.C., and I was a clear minority in those schools. I was the white, a white kid in a much, like, Gordon was probably 90% black. Wilson was probably 70. Um, 
And I experienced, like, I was bullied, like, by some of the kids. Like, I think that bullies um, seek the other. And so if you're in a school that's 90% black and a black bully will seek you out because you're the other. I was the other. And... Um, and I also, you know, it was excruciating to, in American history, to talk about slavery and then have kids, like, jump up on you after the class, yelling at you about that. It was terrible. Like, it was a nightmare. Um, I mean, I certainly wasn't, like, I I was 12, you know? Like, what did I have to do? Like, I didn't know what the, you know, what the fuck this was about. Like, I just, so I thought that it gave me a really specific um, and peculiar uh, view on this issue of racism, having being the idea of people being judged by the color of their skin. So when I, you know, I was 18 when I wrote it or something like that, and I wrote a song about an anti-racist song saying it's wrong to judge someone by the color of their skin. But I was taking this tact as like as a minority and reversing it. Now I understand it's ham-fisted. I get it. I understand. Like I know that there's a thousand arguments against it. I know that now. And I'm 56. Right, I might have even known it when I was in my twenties, but in nineteen nineteen eighty or whenever it was that I wrote that song, um, I was singing to kids here in Washington D.C. who understood that because they lived here. I wasn't thinking about people, anyone outside of that place or time. Um, so then, like fast forward to say nineteen ninety five, and Fugazi's playing a show in Poland. And this Nazi skinhead guy comes up and thanks me for that song. Yeah. He's like, thank you for singing about the white man. And I was like, wow, that is not... That. Well, there's your transmission right. reception exactly. problem, right? Yeah. Right. Or not a problem, it's just a reality, yeah. right? So um, I really... F I think that these sorts of things are... Um, I think these sorts of things are... Uh, it's contextual. So I knew who I was singing to then. And I think I quickly learned that, um, um, like with Meyer Threat, for instance, the reaction I got about the lyrics and the, how misinterpreted those songs were. You know, like for instance, the song Out of Step, which I thought was a really beautiful economical song. You know, don't smoke, don't drink, don't fuck. At least I can fucking think. I'm out of step. I can't keep up. I can't keep up. I'm out of step with the world. And I thought that. That's that feels clear to me. Can't can't misinterpret that. <laughs> but yeah. in fact, you know, I think you know people really misinterpreted that because they thought it was anti-sex, yeah. which was not anti-sex. Uh, don't drink. No one thought that I was against all intake of fluids, right? Right. So for to me, language counts. And I said don't fuck, but it was really about this idea of uh, people, you know. Being abusive or, or conquest oriented, or you know, taking advantage of other people, just focusing on sex as a way to dominate or as a power thing. Um, and that's why I use the word fuck, um, but also because that's what everyone was talking about. So I was trying to get in their face, and it worked. Um, but it was deeply mis <laughs> misunderstood because everyone thought that we were like that, or not we. I was a like some a celibate dude, which I was not, and was not promoting. Um, so I realized early on that words can be misinterpreted and I uh, started thinking about who am I singing to. So say Embrace, I knew like there was a more political thing going on in the scene. There was a community and I knew who I was singing to. And then Fugazi in the very beginning, I knew who I was singing to. And then at some point I was really writing to the other members of Fugazi, right? Because that's who, like that was, you know, that was, you just, it wasn't until, and then I was writing to Amy, but then at some point, I just didn't know who I was singing to anymore. And that's the part I think you were trying to get at, like this idea of the conversation. Like, I just don't know who I'm singing to. Because when I sing, like even this podcast, like I don't know who I'm talking to. Like I'm talking to you theoretically, mm -hmm. right? But that's not who's listening. Like well, you might be listening at this moment. Right. But that's the whole thing about podcasts. Like, you know, you're not the only one listening. Right. Um, and... So when I talk about, say, the song Guilty Being White, there might be somebody out there who will be saying, like, oh, I totally understand what he's saying. And somebody else will say, you know, that's bullshit. That's like, you know, you're you're entitled, like, you're, blah, 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 you know, whatever. They, right. it, it, that's the thing. So I think with with um, writing songs, like, I knew who I was, when I knew who I was writing to or who I was in conversation with musically, uh, if I felt some context, 
it was helpful for me in terms of knowing how to how to address them. That's all. How to address these people. And I think that the uh, the generational component, people who, I, who have seen me for 40 years playing music and people who have never seen me and everyone in between, it's hard to quite know like how to approach it because if I if I bring it one way, then the people who've known me forever, are like oh god, he's still doing that. And if I play it the other way, the people who've never seen me before, are like well, he seems kind of reserved, or you know, it just yeah. it's it's why in some ways I prefer playing on the road. Ian talking about being a young man sitting in the ticket takers booth of the Georgetown Theater and being able to write a thousand songs just from watching the faces of the people that walked by. He didn't have a family then. He didn't have a record label to run. His time was much more his own. A lot of artists write iconic works in their early 20s, and one reason for that, among many others, is probably that it's the most appropriate time in your life to look inward, to look inward in a way that excludes almost all other responsibilities. It's a period in your life when you can be justifiably selfish. And for whatever reason, that leads to great art. The legendary poet Rimbaud wrote his masterworks in his late adolescence, and in fact, stopped writing altogether by age 21. Still, his work crackles on the page in the same way that Ian's early writing with Minor Threat jumps off the tape that it was recorded onto. Rimbaud has a poem that describes this intense, monomaniacal phase of life perfectly. Ironically enough for this episode, the poem is entitled The Drunken Boat. It's entirely too long for this episode, but I'd like to read you an excerpt from Luis Varese's beautiful translation from French. As I came down the impassable rivers, I felt no more the bargemen's guiding hands. Targets for yelling redskins, they were nailed naked to painted poles. What did I care for any crews, carriers of English cotton or Flemish grain? Bargemen and all that hubbub left behind, the waters let me go my own free way. In the furious lashings of the tides, emptier than children's minds, I, through that winter, ran. And great peninsulas unmoored never knew more triumphant uproar than I knew. The tempest blessed my wakings on the sea. Light as a cork, I danced upon the waves. Eternal rollers of the deep sunk dead. Nor missed I at night the lantern's idiot eyes. Sweeter than sour apples to a child, green waters seeped through all my seams, washing the stains of vomit and blue wine and swept away my anchor and my helm. And since then, I've been bathing in the poem of star-infused and milky sea, devouring the azure greens where, flotsam pale, a brooding corpse at times drifts by. Where, Dying suddenly the blue, rhythms delirious and slow in the blaze of day, stronger than alcohol, vaster than your leers, ferment the bitter reds of love. I know the lightning open skies, water spouts, eddies and surfs. I know the night and dawn arisen like a colony of doves. And sometimes I have seen what men have thought they saw. I've seen the low sun, fearful with mystic signs, lightning with far-flung violent arms, like actors in an ancient tragedy, the fluted waters shivering far away. I've dreamed green nights of dazzling snows, slow kisses on the eyelids of the sea, the terrible flow of unforgettable saps, and the singing phosphors waking yellow and blue.
every time there's an article written about you, uh, much is always made about the principles that you've always lived by and your integrity, but the the level of analysis that they want to talk about it on is always how that's morally good. And what I wanted to close with today, I'd like to posit to you that, you know, you've kept a small business open for three decades, and it's a four small, decades, four decades now, uh, and it's a small business that's based on creative output. So that's practically impossible. Um, so I just wanted to posit to you that instead of us talking about those kind of principles on a on a moral level, it seems to me like those have been great for business. So what in your mind is a hallmark of a sustainable business um, and one that people could keep open for years as a creative person? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't know moral, if it's ethical or moral, I'm not sure what the distinction is, but maybe ethical. I, I don't know either. Yeah. yeah, ethical would be a better, um, yeah. Uh, do you think that those have contributed to uh, the success, or do you think it is just? Of course, I mean, yeah. I you know, I mean, if it's kind of, I mean, think about it. To me, I have to say that everything I've done, like on that level, business wise, super practical. I'm a pragmatic guy, you know. Like you didn't talk to my manager to arrange this, or my booking agent, or you didn't talk to my publicity person. You didn't have to go through like you know. You talked to yeah. me. It's just practical. It's pragmatic. You know, like. You didn't come in here and see like a somebody like somebody else wasn't tying these cords up. I was tying the cords <laughs> up. It's pragmatic, you know. And I think that I'm. I was interested in the idea of um, creating something that would go for as long as it needs to go on for. I didn't actually. Ha I don't didn't want to have a record label. It wasn't my desire. Like I have nobody in my family comes from the record industry. Nobody I knew came from the record industry. I actually don't like the record industry. That's why we have the label, right? Um, I was just talking to uh, this friend of mine who was in the hospital, and we were talking about some other people we know who had a terrible time with their label and got robbed, blah, 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 by their manager, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just such an alien concept to me um, because I just, that's why I got into, that's what punk was for me was to not be a part of that. Um, I guess I'm an ethical guy, um, but again, like if I'm walking down the street, I I'm not interested in robbing other people because it makes I guess it would make it seem to really not pragmatic after a while because you're always running, you know, and and, and I don't want to be robbed. Um, and if someone else is robbing somebody, I feel like that probably shouldn't happen, you know. And so I feel like that there's, it's to me if it seems so clear that if we work together, we can go farther. And you know, it's an interesting thing. Like I don't really believe in nations. You know, um, I understand that human beings are somewhat sorted out by their geography, but if you look at it the continent of Europe, for instance, and the number of different kinds of people squeezed in, as opposed to, say, the United States, which is a bigger piece of land, and then somehow that's one country. Um, it doesn't make any sense, really. Like, it's not geographic. It's just it's some weird state of mind or something. But mostly, it's... like When they stretch, they remove the borders within the United States people got along, theoretically, right? Because there wasn't this delineation based on whatever. I mean, clearly, in Europe, you have different languages and different cultures. Um, but it's interesting to me, like, how those things, those cultural differences result in friction. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer, I think that life would be better if we got along. That's all. So I think I try to get along. That's that's it. So I'm not like the people who work for me. I don't like you know the people who work at Discord. I tell them I don't own your time. Discord doesn't own your time. You own your time. Um, that means you don't have to be here at whatever time. You come when it's right for you. You just have to get your work done. But I want everyone to feel right. like. That they, that I don't I don't want to own their time. That's what most jobs are. Like people don't own their own time anymore. They don't own their own lives. 
that feels unhealthy to me. And it feels like it would be a source of bitterness. Um, the, I have a friend who was, you know, all the punk rock, none of us had jobs, really, the punks. Well, we had part-time jobs. Right. And I had a friend who, she got a full-time gig at some point. It was a good, it was a good you know, Washington Post. And she was stunned by what a full-time job reality was. Like, she'd never really had one. And she goes, it is really, really different to have to be there five days a week. And suddenly, like, the weekends really take shape in a way that previously didn't because every day was sort of like, oh, well, you know, may have to be at the bookstore later on or maybe you don't, but ultimately, you, there's no... But when you get into that lockdown, and you, and also, it's unending, right? Like, you look... You try to look up the road, and you're like, I'm going to be doing this forever. Yeah. And I think that uh, that occurred to me probably when I was in 10th or 11th grade. And I had this moment where I thought I, I, thought I was going to be hit by a car. I, I didn't. I wasn't. And I wasn't, I wasn't hit by the car that day. But I thought I was going to. And I thought I would die because it seemed like a pretty terrible situation up, upon me. Um, and I started to contemplate my death at that age. 16 or whatever it was. And uh, I thought, shit, if I had died then, I would have spent like the majority of my sort of cohesive, like sort of life, like my the life that I could remember in this sort of institutional setting, you know, like five days a week, going to school from nine to three. And I thought, that's not what life is. That's like a structure imposed on me by some other, like by society. And I decided right then, like, oh, I'm not going to volunteer for four more of those. So fuck college. I'm not going. Um, also, my family didn't have any money, and I wasn't <laughs> going to get, I wasn't right. about to, like, I realized if I was to take out school loans, I'd have to pay them back. You're a slave to that now. Right. Yeah. So if you pay them back, that means you got to get a job. And then you're just in, and that's it. Like you're in. And I thought, I'm not, I'm going to, I wasn't, I actually thought I'd probably end up going to college at some point, but I wasn't going to go right away. And as soon as I made that decision, it was like this incredible, like, liberation. Like I didn't care, like the PSATs didn't matter so much, SATs, I just didn't, it was fine. Like I didn't, it didn't, I wasn't freaking out. My friends in school were bugging out what are they going to do with their lives. I didn't, wasn't worried. I, I was, because here's the thing, I don't think about the future. So I never did. I just thought, like, people say, what are you going to do with your life? I go, I'm living it. I got my list I got to bang out today. Right. That's <laughs> what I do. Like, I'm, like, I don't ever, and people say, where do you see yourself in five years? I don't. Like, I think when people talk about where do you see yourself in five years or 10 years, it seems so ridiculous to me. Like, um, like when did you start this podcast? Two and a half years ago. All right. So five years ago. Mm -hmm. Were you familiar with my work, my music, whatever? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So five years ago, would it have been even remotely conceivable that you and I be sitting here with headphones on and microphones talking to each other? It would not be remotely conceivable that I would be doing a podcast, much less being in a room with right. you. Yes. That's my point. Yeah. So what the fuck do you know about the future? So that's how I look at it. Like, so you think about life, like there's a, even said a song called Around the Corner, and that concept of Around the Corner is the future is always that point in time that's around the corner. You can't quite see it. It's like a curved road. You're driving, you're on the road, and it's always just what's out of view. That's the future. And, um, you know, and I, I tell people, you don't know what's around the corner. It could be, if you're on a mountain road, it could be, you know, could be a, a like a rock, you know. There might have been a, a, a you know an avalanche or something. There might be you know snow, or it might be like rocks in the road, or it might be the road might widen and yeah. be downhill, or it might be uphill, or it might be cracked, or there might be you know who knows? It might be a car crash. You don't know. You don't know what's around the corner ever. Yeah. Um, you can't plan on it so much as pay attention to where you are. If you're paying attention to where you are and you're in control of your vehicle and you're aware. And as you come to the future and it becomes the present, you'll know what to do because you're in control. But if you're staring at a point in the distance, let's just say you're on a, on a, going along a road that's along the side of, say, a, the ocean, like the coast, and you can, it, the kind of road juts in and out, like, you know, following the sort of curvature of the 
the mountains. Um, you might be able to see the road maybe you know in the distance, maybe half a mile or away. You could see the road coming back out. You can't see what's between that, but you can see you can see the road, and you can see maybe a boulder or something is mm-hmm. fallen on the road. Um, but if you're staring at that, you just crashed where you are. If you're focused only on that. So I always think just trust yourself, focus on the moment. Um, all this stuff, like I know it's like it's it's all a, it's pra- it's practical thinking for me. So I think with the label, I always just looked at what's in front of me, the work that's in front of me. And like right now, like 38 in, years in, like our, we don't put out a lot of new records. We're primarily a historical label. Like we have a catalog. Um, but about five years ago, I was thinking about it. Maybe 10 years ago. But I was thinking about this label and my work and how unusual my life is compared to most people I know, like in this city, certainly, like, <laughs> like by the way I live. And I thought, oh, what a gift. Like, what a gift. Who made this gift possible? And I thought, oh, all the people in the bands who tr- entrusted me with their music. I mean, we, I don't, I've never used a single contract with anybody. I don't have a lawyer. Like, I don't, this has been just an agreement between people, friends. And I haven't had a single band, like, say, give us our tape back, or, you know, you're ripping us off. Never. Um, pay royalties every six months. Be honest. Do just be do the right thing. That seems so clear to me. And about so I was thinking about these all these people who've entrusted me with music for so many years. And I realize now that as and this seems completely reasonable that the attention on this label would be winnowing. Because it's getting older and older. It's wrong on the tooth, right? I mean, we're talking about records that came out almost 40 years ago. Um, So the relevance, um, of course, is is slipping because time moves on. I mean, 1981, I was buying records that were made in 1941. Right. Right? That would be crazy. Uh, But I realized that, like, okay, so the label, like, it's small. We sell fewer and fewer records. And it's getting smaller, which is fine. Like, I'm comfortable with that. Like, all living things die. And this label is a living thing because it is attached to a community of living people. And as it, that community starts to die, then the, you know, the people die, the community dies, the label dies. It's all natural. Totally fine with that. But, so the label has gotten smaller, and I thought, oh, well, maybe it's just time to get out of this. Oh, no. Now I have a custodial responsibility. Because they have entrusted me with this music. And uh, as long as there are people in the world who are interested in hearing this music, I have a responsibility to make it available. So in whatever form. So it might be vinyl or it might be you know, you know, cassettes, CDs, or digital. But I feel like I have that responsibility even with diminishing returns. I don't, I'm not like most business people. I don't think of it like that. I think like, okay, like they've made... Impossible to get me to get, you know, my life has been this unusual life. So now I owe it to them to do this. And it's it's really was such a liberating thought, again, because now I know what I'm doing. I'm looking after, like, I have a responsibility to, like, see this thing through. And um, specifically two bands, and it gets a little confusing here because they're both bands I'm in, mm-hmm. like Meyer Threat and Fugazi, who are Heads and shoulders sell, I mean, I mean, you know, like both of them have sold you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of records. And the next biggest band is like sold 60,000 or something. Right. Um, so, or maybe, you know, maybe maybe 70 or 80,000 if you combine their things. But um, so those two bands specifically, um, I feel like we have a responsibility to. And forgive my... Like I understand, I'm in I'm in the band. I'm also in the label. So when I say we, I'm referring to the label, sure. and then the band. You know, I have to speak like this. So the label has a responsibility to these two bands because they are really the primary engines of this of the label. Now, when Meyer Threat broke up in 1983, 
our best song record had sold 5,000 copies. Maybe not even that, maybe 3,500 copies at that point. Um, so the other 900 some thousand copies happened after that, right? In the inter intervening years between then and now. Fugazi, on the other hand, we were selling hundreds of thousands of records while we were active. And Fugazi, Minor Threat never was offered a deal with a label, so they didn't have to make that decision. Fugazi was offered numerous deals. And, and in theory, had we actually even investigated it, probably would have been extremely lucrative. So Fugazi members, collectively, it wasn't just me, I actually had to recuse myself to some degree, it was decided that we are staying with Discord. It's, you know, that's our, our, our thing. So that is an example of, you know, that band like decided to forego yeah. money, like right off the, you know, right there. I mean, it's real, real deals um, to stay with the label. So I feel like this label has an enormous responsibility to that band. Yeah. So the last buck, last buck we spend, I think will be spent making a Fugazi record. Yeah. Well, man, that's a beautiful answer, and that's an hour of your time, and I appreciate it so much. Did you get close to what you wanted to know? <laughs> oh, so much, man. That was, that was a great interview, man. Ian's latest release is the 2012 album by The Evens entitled The Odds. Today's episode was mixed by Matt Schusler. Research was provided by Paul Barbagallo. And this episode was brought to you by associate producer John McGeehan, whose company, Capital for Compassion, specializes in financing for new construction for low-income housing. Their most recent work was the Salvation Army's Rath Gaber Center for Women and Children in Austin, Texas. Okay, that's it. Before we meet again, if you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>